welcome as we gather for worship on the day the master has made. Yes, this is the master's day, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, as we uh, gather for worship, first of all, our prayer concerns for the week. Uh, Chantal Hotchkiss, Steve Gray, Pastor Ken Grass, Peggy Brockman, and uh, Kay Barton, and Cindy Warren. We keep those folks in our prayers this week, as well as the folks that are on the prayer list uh, online. Now, as we gather, for, welcome everybody to work with, to worship. We welcome the folks who are with us online, as well as those who are with us today. And uh, I suppose we have a few others that are visiting just up the hill today as well. Yes. And uh, remember, a uh, reminder, uh, we're, you know, working on the church directory, this is the, the contact information sheet that uh, uh, Rachel needs us to fill out so she can, and we can update our church records. So please do that. And of course, it's, it's all there, what, what's needed, and you can... Uh, Email, drop those off, send them in any which way you want to send them. We'll give them to Cindy uh, in the church office, and uh, we'll be good to go. All right. Uh, see, if you, we, want to, we, we, we really need to do that so we can pacify Rachel as soon as we can. So. <laughs> and uh, now... Uh, in a few moments before, uh, at the end of the announcements, we'll be welcoming Steve Coleman to our congregation, and I'll call on Steve in just a minute, uh, but we have some other announcements. Uh, the welcome cluster meeting in, at Jerusalem Church in uh, uh, Rinkin, Georgia. Uh, you, the ladies are aware of that, and that, that will be happening uh, later this month. Our Lutheran Legends on the 30th will be going to the Finnessy Swamp Nature Park, and I think that's going to be a lot of fun. And chance to have a, there's a possibility we can have a picnic if the weather be good, I guess. So that sounds like fun. And continue, we're continuing to connect the, collect the personal care kits. Uh, and the personal care kits are in uh, support of, of uh, Lutheran World Relief. And in addition to collecting them for ourselves uh, to send to Lutheran World Relief, the Synod wants us to collect some for them too. So pick up an extra three or four dark colored towels uh, for the Synod. And then we'll be have a temple talk in just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Courtney gave me the heads up there. But uh, Vu, the man will be giving, doing a temple talk about unbinding your heart in just a little bit. Uh, so, pardon? <laughs> yeah, no, no, she's, she's over this. I, I, I Courtney said, you know, sure, you know. Just like if you need to know what I'm doing, sometimes if you check with Kathy, you have more, better information. <laughs> and uh, uh, those are the announcements. So first of all, we'll invite Steve down. Steve? Now, following the worship service, Steve will be at this door. So again, for those of you who haven't had the opportunity yet, of course, a lot, most of us have. Steve's been pretty busy with us at worship. And uh, he gave Barbara a hug, so you, well, now you know that Steve is also a Tennessee fan. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. But Steve has come to us, uh, actually from an Episcopal church. And uh, so he desires to transfer his membership. Uh, we welcome him as a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of the Resurrection. Uh, we say Resurrection Church for short. Uh, do you intend to join us in worshiping God, hearing his word, sharing in his supper? Proclaiming the good news of God in Christ, the word and deed, serving all peoples, and striving for justice and peace in all the earth. Yes, and let us now pray. Let's pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have called us to the fellowship of the gospel and bound us together in love and service in your holy church. We pray that Steve, who this day unites with us, may with us become one in you, and that together we may grow in grace and serve our Lord to the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> and now we ask our, our visitors to remain seated. Our members will stand and welcome and greet our visitors, our guests, and one another. <laughs>
please be seated. And now I will call on Wu Nguyen to speak about unbinding your heart. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for giving me a few minutes of your time this morning. A few years ago, Pastor Hunter asked me to lunch. Uh, he told me he was inviting a group of church members to work through an experience called Unbinding Your Heart. I wasn't certain at the time what it was, but I was eager to serve this church, which has been wonderful to all of us and most certainly our family. <clears throat> Unbinding Your Heart is 40 days of prayer and faith sharing. The experience was enlightening for all of us, but I was reminded of one fact. Jesus asks us to do very difficult things in order to follow him and grow in our faith. Over the course of about six weeks, we were asked to pray daily, record observations, meditate on what it means to be a follower of Christ, share these with our group, and pray with each other. For me, it was extremely difficult at first, but it got easier each week. Being vulnerable is not a position in which we like to place ourselves. But one of the most wonderful side effects of this experience was how strong we all came together in support and prayer for each other. We have such a wonderful group of leaders here at Resurrection who are ready to take you through Unbinding Your Heart. Over the next few months, when you're called by them, I would highly recommend that you take part. I can't promise it will be easy. In fact, I can promise it will be uncomfortable and at times difficult. But what I can promise you is that the bonds that are already so strong in this church will be made even stronger as were your faith in Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Boo. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we were in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world, rescuing us from the hopelessness of death. Grant your faithful people a share in the joys that are eternal through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Children. Good morning. How's everybody? Bill, look at the crowd. Very good. Come on down. David, I hope you were kind to me. Come on down. I haven't had a chance to speak to you since Easter, but I want to thank you for the kazoo band. Y'all were great. And I'm thinking next year we'll do cymbals. <laughs> How does that sound? Can y'all play the cymbals? You know what cymbals are? You go, Pow! Won't that be fun? Okay, that's what Their we'll do. Their parents will appreciate that, too, Barbara. Do what? Their parents will appreciate that yes, as well. Yes, and y'all bring the cymbals. <laughs> okay, let's see what David did for us today. You never know. Okay, I think I know what this is. Is it a hockey puck? Yes, and what color is it? Green. What's your favorite color? Orange. Banana, yellow, banana, yellow. All right, now, David, I understand you play hockey, don't you? And you, you ice skate to do that, right? How many can ice skate? Really? Pastor? Look, I knew your hand would be up. Well, I tried it one time, and I looked like uh, an actor from, from years ago. Y'all wouldn't know, but it was, his name was Tim Conway. And this is kind of how, how I ice skated. What? He really is good at skating? Can he do a triple axle? No. No way, no way. Well, let me ask you the other question. How many of you can roller skate? How many can roller skate? Roller skate? I know it. Uh, a little bit? Well, you know, it's, it's a kind of a lost art about roller skating. That was very popular when I was young, um, 10 years ago. And um, it's really a, a really fun thing to do. How many of you can uh, skip rope? Jump, jump rope. Jump, okay. How about, let me ask you this one, hopscotch. Really? I'm so, how about hula hooping? Hula, okay. Well, this is really interesting because the point I'm making this morning is we all have different talents. How many can do a hula hoop really good? You can hula hoop good? Yeah. I will have a hula hoop in two weeks. I used to compete with my sisters. I'm sorry? I used to compete with my sisters. You compete. <laughs> I'm going to have a hula hoop in two weeks and we'll see. <laughs> okay. What else can y'all do? Who can play the piano? You can play the piano? <laughs> Miss Pritchard's raising, she's raising her hand up there. Okay. How about, okay, hockey. You do hockey. Soccer. I knew soccer would do it. Soccer would do it. Y'all are on the same team? Well, I think what David, all right, we all have different talents, and I think that that's important to know because when you're serving the Lord, we can all help in different ways, okay? It's, we can dack a light, we can sing in the choir, we can play bells, we can, do, we can read, be a lay assistant, help serve communion. So we need to know our talents and make the best of them, right? How many goals have you scored? 20? Let's say 20. All right, 20. It doesn't matter as long as you're playing and trying hard and using the talent that the Lord gave you. And that's what I, the message I want to give to you today is we all have different talents, but it's important to use those talents, especially to serve the Lord in this wonderful church. Okay? Thank you all so much. Who wants the box? Well... <laughs> Let's do, all right, Faith, let's see what you bring to the table. Bring a snake. <laughs> no. Well, you can, because it's his turn. <laughs> there we go. What, what are you scared of? Huh? Yeah. 
<laughs> He's not going to tell. Thank you all. Have a beautiful day. Oh, Thank you, David. <clears throat> oh, Thank you. Air. Thank you all. A reading from Acts, the third chapter. Peter addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, and as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Here ends the reading. <laughs> A reading from 1 John, the third chapter. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he has, re 
was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins, no one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Here ends the reading. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Jesus himself stood among them and said to the disciples, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, the gospel of the Lord. Praise Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Creator and our Redeemer. Lord, take our eyes and see through them, our lips and speak through them. Take our hands and work through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. In today's gospel, there's a phrase that gets my attention every time I read it. It's when Luke tells us that the disciples disbelieved for joy. I've often wondered at the seeming contradiction inspired by those words. How is it that anyone can disbelieve for joy? After all, aren't we Christians convinced that just the opposite is true? That our joy is the result of our faith? How then might Jesus' disciples, or you or me for that matter, disbelieve or be disturbed by joy? To get at this seeming contradiction, we need to return to Jerusalem. Consider the scene. Jerusalem, like Augusta after Masters, is almost back to normal after the annual Passover holiday week. The thousands of visitors who made their pilgrimages to the holy city have left town. The tension between the swelling Jewish population and the Roman occupational troops has subsided. The feast of the Passover has come and gone. The street crews are working to clean up the city. Historically speaking, during Passover week and the days that followed, Jerusalem had to be described as a place of mass confusion. When we turn to scripture, we see even more confusion. The crowd's confusion. On Palm Sunday, they hailed a man on a donkey as their Messiah, and yet clamored for his crucifixion on Friday. The religious leaders, we see their confusion as they determined that this Jesus was not the Messiah. The disciples' confusion as they fled and hid on that night of terror before Jesus' crucifixion and Pilate's confusion as he handed over a man he believed to be innocent 
to satisfy an angry mob. Then, of course, there are the resurrection accounts themselves. It's a curious fact that in all four accounts it is clear that the immediate impact of the experience of Christ alive is not joy, as we might expect. Rather, it's the experience of embarrassment or fear or awe or terror, even disbelief. John said they didn't recognize him. Now, all this adds up to the fact that whatever else the disciples and the followers of Jesus may have hoped for or desired prior to the death and even after it, quite unlike our Easter celebrations, they did not expect this. This, Jesus standing alive before them, bearing the scars and marks of his wounds, eating with them. This is the last thing they expected. They were frightened, embarrassed, confused. For the end, Easter was not the happy ending that it is for us. When they experienced Christ alive, they didn't go off walking hand in hand into the sunset with a choir of angels singing softly in the wings. Instead, they were terrified. Luke says they disbelieved for joy. Jesus' disciples and followers were disturbed by the resurrection. It's an odd reaction, I admit, but that's exactly what happened. But there's more to this disturbance, I suspect, than just the fact that a living Jesus is the last thing they expected to see. You see, before Easter brings its inevitable joy, it also brings judgment. And no doubt that's what terrified them too. You see, when they buried Jesus in that tomb, they buried not only all their hopes and dreams and all the promises that he had held out for them and all the love and care and concern he had shown, all of that was buried with him. But that's not all that was buried. Along with all this, they also buried their weak and shoddy faith, their shabby me-first quarrels as to who would be the greatest in the kingdom, all the petty jealousies and impatience with him, the ugly scenes of denial and betrayal, all that was buried too. As they buried him, they also buried the fact that they deserted him. No wonder they were disturbed by joy. You see, all of this was suddenly alive again. The promises, the love, the joy they had known was alive to be sure. But so were the sad betrayals and pettiness and the indifference. No wonder the emotions of the moment sound like contradictions because they are. Now, no matter how hard we try, we cannot get back to the unexpectedness of Jesus' resurrection. We have simply lived too long on the Easter side of the cross. But we just might be able to relate to their disbelief for joy. Let me tell you about an interesting conversation, discussion I had in a confirmation class one time. The general subject under discussion was the sacrament of baptism, but the specific question concerned the Holy Spirit. After establishing the fact that we receive the Holy Spirit in baptism, I like to ask the question, how do you know the Holy Spirit is active in your life? The answers always relate to church and to feelings in some way. And we eventually get around to the fact that the real evidence that the Holy Spirit is alive and active in the life of any Christian is that person's belief that Jesus Christ and him crucified is God's son. You see, that's not the way we think about God. When we think about God, we think about images of power. We don't think about God washing feet or God dying. You see, that's not the way our human minds work. And while there is some controversy, it's important for us to know that God is active in our lives. Now, I'm aware that in contemporary Christian movements, there are different understandings of the Holy Spirit. But the biblical, clearest biblical message is that the gift of the Holy Spirit, the clearest gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift of faith. Faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Well, we answered the question that day, but the discussion didn't end. 
We continued to talk about it. And then we got behind the question to some very real insight. What these young Christians said, in effect, is that the question itself was disturbing. Even with the biblical truth that their faith says clearly that the Holy Spirit is active in their lives, they still said that it was downright uncomfortable to think that God is active in our lives because we should be better than we are. Now that's insight. You see, when we begin to think of something so significant as God at work in our lives, then we also come face to face with our own human weaknesses. When we turn our thoughts to God in that way, the hardcore bottom line is the truth of our sinfulness gets in God's way. When we get to matters so serious as this, then we realize there are two people we cannot fool, God and me. Each of us knows the real truth about ourselves. And when we get down to me and God, that is the time for truth. And the truth is that we're not as good as we should be. And at that moment, God's presence can be disturbing. And that is, I think, in part, the same feeling that Jesus' disciples and followers experienced when they were suddenly confronted with the living Jesus. It is at this very point, the moment of truth between us and God, that today's gospel is good news for his disciples and for us. Luke tells us that Jesus opened the scriptures for his disciples that day. He showed them the window through which we are to view and interpret Holy Scripture. Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. That is the perspective from which all of Jesus' followers approach the study of Holy Scripture. That is the message which had to be received as joy by those disturbed disciples. That is also Jesus' commission to his disciples, that they were to preach the message of repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name to all the world. And that is still Jesus' commission to the church, to tell people of God's grace and forgiveness and salvation in his son, Jesus Christ. It is our mission as well. And our church, the ELCA has declared that we are to become a renewed church. And they have asked, what would a renewed church look like? I'll tell you what's the truth. It will be a church whose members are excited about and energized by Jesus' great commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them all that I have commanded you. And that surely has been a great challenge and maybe even a bit disturbing to we shy Lutherans. It's difficult to talk about and share our faith and invite others into that same relationship. But you see, there is help. Before, we would just say we have to do it, but we wouldn't we wouldn't give you any help. But as you listen to Boo today describe his experience in unbinding your heart, you see we have a real hands-on approach to enable us shy Lutherans to open up and to begin to invite people, invite people and connect them to Jesus Christ, to the grace and promise of God and the mission of God here and now hands-on. And who knows? We too could end up just believing for joy. You know what happened to those first disciples? You know what happened again during the Reformation? And if we let Jesus unbind our hearts and our voices, it could happen again. Amen. <laughs>
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Gathered at the empty tomb, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. O oh God, our Holy One, you feed our deepest hungers. As we share the holy meal that is the body and blood of Jesus given for us, lead us to share all that we have and find in generosity abundant life. God of grace, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. O God, our creator, you bring forth all life on earth. Calm storms bring water to parched places and protect the climate, that this planet would sustain life in all its variety. God of grace, hear our prayer. O God, our savior, you offer wisdom and guidance beyond all human knowledge. Instruct lawmakers, judges, and elected officials to make decisions grounded in your justice and care for all people. God of grace, hear, hear our, our prayer. O oh God, our elder, you care for all your children. Encourage those who are facing the loss of old ways and routines and anticipating change. Guide those who journey in grief, hope, and uncertainty, especially Steve Gray, Pastor King Gross, Peggy Brockman, Kay Barton, Cindy Warren, and Chantel Hotchkiss. God of grace, Hear our prayer. O oh God, our center, you bring all people together in you. Help us to remember our purpose in ministry. Move us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to share in beloved community. God of grace, hear our prayer. We humbly ask that you watch over the members of our congregation and today we especially pray for Pat King, Linda Sack, John Leibach, and Janie Jones. God of grace, hear, hear our prayer. O oh God, our resting place, your son Jesus promised that we are held in your love forever. We remember our beloved who have died. As we remember and share their love, Comfort those who mourn. God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and ever-living God. But chiefly we are bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of our Lord. For he is the true Passover lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who by his death has destroyed death and by his rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. And gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for altered drink, saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
May the body and blood of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Almighty God, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. and serve the Lord. Thanks.